complete Grimm's fairy tales, Thumbling's Travels. A certain tailor had a son who happened to be small and no bigger than a thumb, and on this account he was always called Thumbling. He had, however, some courage in him and said to his father, Father, I must go and will go out into the world. That's right, my son, said the old man, and took a long darning needle and a knob of sealing wax on it in a handle and said, and there's your sword for you to take with you on your way. And then the little tailor wanted to have one more meal with him and hopped into the kitchen to see what his mother had cooked for the last time. But it was already served and the dish stood on the hearth. Then he said, mother, what is there to eat today? See for yourself, said his mother. So Thumbling took, jumped onto the hearth and peeped into the dish and he stretched his neck in too far, the steam and the food caught hold of him and carried him up into the chimney. He rode about in the air and the steam for a while until at length he sank back down to the ground again. Now the little tailor was outside in the wide world, and he traveled about and went to master in his craft, but the food was not good enough for him. Mistress, if you give us no better food, said Thumbling, I will go away, and early tomorrow will, I will write with chalk on the door of your house. Too many potatoes, too little meat. Farewell, Mr. Potato King. What would you have foreseen then grasshopper said the mistress and grew angry and seized a dishcloth and was just going to strike him but my little tailor crept nimbly under the thimble and peeped out beneath it and put his tongue out at his mistress she took up the thimble and wanted to get a hold of little thumbling who'd hopped then onto a cloth and while the mistress was opening it out looking for him he got into a crevice under the table <laughs> lady mistress he cried and he thrust out his head and he began to she began to strike at him as he leapt down into the drawer. At last, however, she caught him and drove him out into the house. The little tailor journeyed on and came to a great forest, and there he fell in with a band of robbers who had a design to steal the, king tre the king's treasure. When they saw the little tailor, they thought, a little fellow like this can creep in through the keyhole and serve to, as a picklock for us. Hey there, cried one of them, you giant... Goliath, will you go in the treasure chamber with us? You can slip yourself in and throw out the money. Thumbling reflected for a while, and at length he said yes, and went with them to the treasure chamber. Then he looked at the doors above and below to see if any if there was a crack in any of them. It was not long before he espied which was broad enough to let him in. He was therefore about to get in at once, but one of the two sentries who stood before the door observed him and said to the other, What an ugly little spider is creeping there? I'll kill it. Let the poor creature alone, said the other. It has done you no harm. Then Thumbling got safely through the crevice to, into the trevice chamber and opened the window beneath which the robbers were standing and threw them out to them, one tailor after another. When the little tailor was in full swing with his work, he heard the king coming to inspect the treasure chamber and he crept hastily into a hiding place. The king noticed that several solid tallers were missing, but could not conceive who could have stolen them, for the locks and bolts were all in good condition, and all seemed well guarded. But then he went away again, and he said to the sentries, Be on watch. Someone is after the money. When therefore Thumbling recommenced his labors, they heard the money moving, and saw the sound of clink, clink, clink. Then they ran swiftly in to seize the thief, but the little tailor, who heard them coming, was still swear and leapt into a corner and covered himself with the tallow, so nothing could be seen of him. At the same time, he mocked the sentries and cried, Here I am! And the sentries ran about, but they got, but as they got there, he had already hopped into another corner and under another tallow, saying, <laughs> Here I am! And the watchmen sprang up in their haste, but Thumbling had long ago got into a third corner and was crying, <laughs> here I am. And thus he made fools of them and drove them so long around the treasure chamber that they were weary and finally went away. Then by degrees he threw out all the tallers, dispatching the last with all his might. He hopped nimbly upon it and flew down with it through the window. The robbers paid him great compliments. You are a valiant hero, they said. Will you be our captain? Thumbling, however, declined and said he wanted to see the world first. Thus they now divided the booty, but the little tailor only asked for a cruiser because he could not carry any more. When then he once more buckled down his sword and bade the robbers goodbye and took the road. First he went to work for some masters, but he had no liking for that, and at last he hired himself as a manservant at an inn. The maids, however, could not endure him, for he saw all 
they did secretly without them, without their seeing him. And he told their employers what they had taken off the plates, carried away from the cellar for themselves. Then they said, wait, and we will pay you out and arranged with each other to play him a trick. Soon afterwards, when one of the maids was mowing in the garden, she saw Thumbling jumping about and creeping up and down the plants. And she mowed him up quickly with the grass and tied it all into a great cloth and secretly threw it to the cows. Now amongst them was a great big black cow who'd swallowed him down without hurting him. Down below, however, it did not suit him for it was quite dark and neither had any candle burning. And when the cow was being milked, he cried, strip, strap, stole. When will the pail be full? But the noise of the milking prevented him being understood. And after this, the master of the house came into the stall and said, that cow should be killed tomorrow. Then Thumbling was so alarmed that he cried out in a clear voice, let me out first. I'm sitting inside here. The master heard that quite well, but did not know where the voice came from. Where are you? asked he. In the black cow, answered Thumbling, but the master did not understand what that meant and went out. The next morning, the cow was killed and happily Thumbling did not meet with one blow at the cutting up and chopping of the cow. And he got up among the sausage meat. And when the butcher came in and began his work, he cried out with all his might, don't chop too deep. Don't chop too deep. I'm in amongst it. No one heard this because of the noise of the chopping knife. Now poor Thumbling was in trouble, but trouble sharpens the wits. And he sprang out so adroitly between the blows that none of them touched him. And he escaped with his whole skin, but still he could not get away. And there was nothing for him to, but to let himself be thrust into a black pudding with bits of bacon. His quarters were rather confined, and besides, he was hung up in the chimney to be smoked, and there did time hang terribly, and there time hung terribly on his hands. At length in winter, he was taken back down again, as the black pudding had to be set up for, before a guest. When the hostess was cutting in the slices, he took care not to stretch his head too far, lest it be chopped off. And at last he saw his opportunity and cleared a passage out for himself and jumped out. The little tailor, however, would not stay any longer in a house where he'd fared so ill. So at once he set out on his journey again, but his liberty did not last long. In the open country, he met with a fox who snapped him up without thinking. Hi there, Mr. Fox, cried the little tailor. It is I who am sticking in your throat. Set me at liberty at once. You are right, answered the fox. You are the next to nothing for me, but if you will promise me that the fowls in your father's yard, I will let you go. With all my heart, replied Thumbling, you shall have all the roosters and hens that I promise you. And then the fox let him go, and he himself carried him home. When the father saw once more his dear son, he willingly gave the fox all his fowls that he had. For this, I likewise bring you a handsome bit of money, said Thumbling, and gave his father a cruiser, which he had earned on his travels. But why did the fox get the poor chickens to eat? Oh, you silly, your father surely loves his child far more than he fouls in the yard.